Today I'm going to talk about a project that I worked on at DNCO as a machine learning engineer. I uh, just want to say it's kind of cool to be in this place here. I actually spent six years at Columbia uh, in grad school, and I think the last time I was in this building, I was buying like discount movie tickets, and so it's fun to be back. Um, but before I get into all of these buzzwords up here, and I'm going to get deep into them, uh, I got to explain what uh, Dia and Co does. Uh, so Dia and Co is a personal styling service for plus-size women, um, and uh, what I'd like to start out with is a quote to kind of explain why this company exists. And so we have kind of this shocking statistic that 70% of women in the US are plus size, but they only represent about 16% of apparel spend. And so you have the majority of US women and then definitely a minority of dollars spent. And so some people might think that, you know, this is just the way the market is. Uh, these people are not interested in purchasing clothes and things like that. But we are of the opinion that that is totally not the case. Uh, and in fact, the market has failed this population. And so that's where Dia & Co comes in, in order to kind of fill uh, this void. And we do that through an innovative business model. So as a personal signing service, uh, first you come to our website and you fill out a profile about yourself. Uh, where you tell us what sorts of clothing you like, what sorts of clothing you don't like, etc. Uh, we then have a human stylist go into kind of like an internal e-commerce tool to virtually pick out clothing to send to you that they think that you will like. Uh, so we then send you five items of clothing in a box. You are then free to try the clothing on in the comfort of your own home. Whatever you like, you keep and pay for, and whatever you don't like, you can send back to us. Shipping's free. Uh, that's all good. And then if there's things that you didn't like, you can tell us online. If there's things that you did like, tell us that as well. And then uh, we get better at understanding you and the relationship gets better. Um, and so that's kind of like the core DIA business model. And this stayed this way for uh, a couple years. Um, but then this past spring, we decided to try expanding our product line. And so uh, the, what we ended up deciding to do was to ship boxes of active wear. So the core Dia product is kind of everyday style clothes. We decided to build these active boxes. So this is both performance athletic wear and athleisure wear. And so the entire process was the same. Uh, you come in, fill out your profile, five items in the box and everything else. Uh, but what this gave us an opportunity to do as a business was to kind of rethink all of the processes in our business that have been in place during the past couple years. And so what we did was we actually rebuilt everything from the ground up. So we built out a brand new survey that customers fill out, a brand new product catalog, and then we rethought the entire styling process. And so as the leader of the styling data team, this gave me a chance to think through how do we do things today and how can we do them differently and better. Um, and so we ended up on this very ambitious goal for ourselves, and that goal was to write an algorithm to style all boxes for a given day at once. And uh, to be clear, we still, we're going, we still use human stylists. Uh, the difference here is that we wanted to write the algorithm to pre-fill the box with five items, and then the stylist comes in and they're free to swap in whatever they want in and out of the box. So kind of like this human in the loop approach that we just heard about in the last session. Um, and so we, we were like, all right, like, we're going to do this. Um, but you might be asking why. So what's the point of pre-filling the box when we still have stylists who are doing, uh, doing the job in the end? And so the reason was kind of twofold. The first reason was that blank canvases are kind of difficult to start with. So uh, you can imagine logging into Netflix, and it's just a blank page. And then you have to go and search and figure out what the hell you feel like watching. Uh, it's a lot easier when you see these suggestions in front of you. As well, for a stylist, it's a lot easier when they see a box of clothing already there. They can see an outfit already there, and then they're free to modify this. Um, but perhaps the bigger reason that we decided to go this route was that we have this problem of greedy humans in the loop. And what this problem ends up doing is it creates inequality across our customer base, uh, which is not a good thing. And so I'd like to kind of explain how this inequality arises through kind of a cartoon version of our original uh, product line. And so let's imagine this cartoon world where we have one stylist, and they have a queue of boxes that they are going to style. Uh, and they're going to style each box one by one in the order that they come into in the queue. 
And let's also imagine that we have a product catalog represented by these emojis. And these are all the different products that we have available to us. And by all means, all of our products are great, but you could imagine that some of them are just exceptional compared to the other ones. And so let's say that we have these exceptional products that are the hard eye emojis and our slightly smiling emojis are all of our other good products, but not exceptional. And so the stylist goes to style this first box. They look at the entire product catalog and they're like, oh, look at all those five awesome products. I'm gonna throw them all in this box because I want this customer to be happy. And they do that and that's great for that customer. The problem is, is that when the next box comes in, this customer, now the stylist doesn't have any of these products to pick from, they just have the rest of the catalog. And through kind of no fault of this customer's own, they just happen to be second in line they end up not getting any of these exceptional products. And so you can imagine if we end up going through this process the entire day, we end up with one customer who reaps all the spoils and then all the other customers uh, don't get this. And so that just doesn't feel fair. And so a better way to deal with is instead of this kind of streaming fashion, we can uh, pre-distribute the wealth in our system by doing a batch process. And so that is the goal of this algorithm, is that the algorithm is able to look across all of the customers that day, our entire product catalog, and it can optimize for everybody's happiness, not just one individual's. And so that way, everybody gets one great product, and then they all also get good products as well. And so that was really the goal here around doing this. And so now that we have this kind of cartoon version, how do we actually do this in practice? Um, we do this through combining machine learning, which probably lots of you already know about. If not, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna talk about it at this conference, uh, with operations research, which uh, was spoken about at the keynote. It's just not as buzzwordy right now, but it ends up being super useful. And so I'd kind of like to frame uh, these concepts uh, around how they work at businesses. And in my mind, the way that all of these things work is there are various ways of automating decision-making at businesses uh, through various granularity of this decision making. And so starting at the left, uh, what I think of analytics, I think of being able to make kind of like broad sweeping decisions for a large group of people. So let's imagine that we're some company, we send out email marketing and we really wanna get our customers to open our emails. Uh, analytics can tell you, it can help you to make the decision that um, you know, you should be sending all your emails at 9 a.m. on Tuesdays because we've looked at the historical data, we ran a SQL query, and we found that this is the time when people are most likely to open emails. And so that, that kind of gives us like one big cut at the decision making. Uh, machine learning, on the other hand, allows us to be hyper-personalized and allows us to make personalized decisions on a one-by-one -one basis. So maybe we look at every single customer, we learn when each of them are most likely to open their emails, and then we send emails at times according to each customer. Uh, but this is still kind of on a one-by-one -one basis. At a business, sometimes you can't be as a, like you can't keep those horse blinders on like that. You have to look at the entire system as a whole. And so that's what operations research allows us to do because there might be constraints at your business. Uh, it could be that you need a certain deliverability of your emails to uh, keep your email service provider happy. Maybe there's throughput in your system. You can't send all of your emails at 9 a.m. on Tuesdays. And operations research allows us to kind of define the constraints of a business and optimize across the whole thing. And so maybe we would learn how do we distribute our emails throughout the week. Uh, but then this is kind of unpersonalized, right? It's, it's not really optimizing for each person's likelihood of opening. And so that's where I think things are really exciting is kind of combining the two of these. So operations research allows us to consider all of the constraints of the real world. And then machine learning allows us to really optimize around what we want to, what we want to improve or what we want to you know, decrease. So that's these concepts kind of in, in a general light. Um, I'm now gonna walk through like an actual toy example of how you yourself can build your own uh, box styling algorithm. And so that's using kind of a subset of operations research which is called integer programming and I'll explain why it's called that in a little bit. Um, and if there's kind of one thing that I want you to take away from this talk, it's that if you wanna set up any of these problems, you have to do these four steps you have to do them in this order, and if you can do that, then you can solve any problem you want. And I'm gonna walk through each of the four steps. Um, and 
I'm going to start with the decision variables. These are the steps for how we build up our problem and then how we solve it. And in order to do this, I'm going to commit kind of the two cardinal sins of any conference talk. I'm going to put math on slides and code as well. And so apologies in advance, but hopefully kind of like one of these speaks to you. Uh, if not, I'll keep speaking. And if none of that works, then we can talk afterwards during office hours. So. Let's start with our decision variables that we have to define. I'm going to have the math on the left, and then I'll introduce the code on the right. And so what is our goal? We want to build an algorithm to figure out which users in our system should receive which items, right? So we have items, which are our clothing. We have a user, which gets a box. And we want to decide which pieces of clothing should each user get. And so let's imagine we have kind of an index of users. We have an index of items, and then we are going to define two decision variables. So this is actually what we're trying to solve for in our model. These are kind of the free parameters, and we want to write an algorithm to figure out what values should these take. So the first one, this is like a, a user indicator variable. What this does is it indicates whether or not user U uh, got a box. So whether or not our algorithm was able to build a box for this customer. Uh, if they're able to get a box, then they get a 1. If they're not able to get a box, then they get a 0. And that, that's actually why this is called integer programming, because you can't get half a box. You can either get no boxes or one box in the way that we're setting up this problem. Um, we have one more decision variable. And this is an indicator indicating whether or not user u gets item i. And so uh, if, we, if the algorithm decides that user u gets item i, then they get a 1. If the algorithm decides that they don't get it, then they get a 0. And the goal of this entire thing is to figure out what should these values be for every user, which users get which items. So let's bring in some code, which will maybe help with this. So uh, everything I'm showing is written in Python, and it's using this open source library called Pulp. Uh, so it's completely free, and it's a pretty great library that allows you to define these problems uh, and solve them. And so again, we have our users and our items, and then our user indicators. This says for each user, uh, we're going to create an indicator variable, which is binary, so it can be 0 or 1. And this is a, a pulp class. And so every user gets an indicator around whether or not they got a box. Likewise, for every user and every item, uh, there's an indicator variable saying, did they get this item or not? So those are our decision variables. Again, the goal is to figure out what are the best values for these to take. And so how do we define what best is? That's where we define our objective function. And so the objective function is going to be some function of our decision variables that we either want to maximize or minimize. And so maybe if you're at a business, cost is, is probably a thing. And maybe you want to minimize cost. Uh, or maybe you have an objective function of profit, which you want to maximize. Um, in our case, this is, where, this is where we get to bring in the machine learning. So imagine we have some score for every user and every item. So maybe we have the, the predicted probability of purchase. We train this fancy model to predict, will this customer buy this shirt? Um, we can train that model ahead of time. And we can decide that our objective function is just going to be the sum of all of those purchase probabilities times whether or not the customer got the item or not. So if the customer doesn't get the item, we don't add anything to our objective function. But if they receive the item, then we add in their predicted probability of purchase. And through this, we can maximize purchases. You could also imagine maximizing other things. Maybe we want to maximize revenue, which might be the purchase probability times the cost of the product or something like that. Anyway, in code, the way that this works is that you set up a problem in pulp. So it's like very academic, the way that they wrote this code. We have a problem. We want to solve it. This is a maximization problem. Uh, you can also define minimization problems, but we want to maximize purchases, not minimize them. Um, great way to minimize purchases is you don't build a box for anybody. Uh, can't buy it if they don't get it. Um, and so the way that our objective function works is that we basically just aggregate everything up into a list. So all of our scores times whether or not the customer got it, aggregate this whole list, sum it all up, and then we add it to our problem, which is kind of just the way that the, the pulp API works. So we have our decision variables. That's what we want to solve for. Now we want to know how we want to solve. We want to maximize purchases. The last step are the constraints in the problem, because sometimes like the real world gets in the way of our problems that we work on. 
And so there's only two constraints in this problem. Um, I'll show both the math here and the code at once. This top constraint, all this is saying is that uh, every customer, if they get a box, they have to get five items. If they don't get a box, they can't get anything. And so the way that that works is for each user, we can add up all of the items that they got by summing up their indicators. And if they get a box, this is going to be one. Yes, they got the box. That's a one. One times five is five. And so five has to be equal to five. So this is something that we're telling our algorithm. Uh, if they get a box, then they have to get five items. If they don't get a box, if this is a zero, zero has to be equal to zero. Therefore, they don't get any items. So this defines how big our box is. Down here, this is just saying that we can't use more products than we have in stock right now. And so how do we know how many products we're using? Well, for each item, we can add up all the users that got the products. And then we can say that that sum has to be less than or equal to however many we have in stock right now. And so that's kind of where the real world comes in. I'd love it if we had infinite products, but, uh, but we don't. And so this way, we can add in real world constraints into our problem. OK, and then the last point, we have our decision variables. We want to maximize purchases. We have the constraints of the real world. Now we have to solve the problem. And frankly, I don't have a great handle on how the math works. Uh, but wonderfully, these algorithms provide you this great little method. You just hit solve, and they crunch away. And then you're like, great. Uh, because <laughs> it was already a lot of work just to get to this point. And so it's, it's nice to at least have this part solved for you. Um, and so that's it. We're through with the math and the code. If you follow that, great. If not, it uh, doesn't matter, because we're going to kind of switch gears. So now I want to talk about how do we go from kind of this toy model that we've built, this, you know, this academic code that lives on our computer, into something that is productionized or productionalized. I've, I've heard both, and I, don't, I feel like our industry has not landed on where these, on which term is correct. Both always end up triggering the spell checker, and so probably neither are correct. And so the rest of the talk is just going to be about how do we make this thing automatically and reliably run in the cloud. And so that kind of starts to get into the, the data eng part, I guess, of this talk. And so I feel like there's about five key areas uh, that allow us to do this and that we did when we built this out uh, at Dia and Co. And so the first one is defining good software architecture. Um, and so one thing that helped me was to kind of define two different uh, like concepts within the code. And these are deterministic concepts and stochastic concepts. And so deterministic, what I mean in this context is these are things that are known ahead of time, like prior to building up your optimization problem. Uh, stochastic, these are kind of functions of the problem themselves, and, and I'll, I'll explain this uh, in more detail. And so let's start with how we think of these concepts around our objective function. And so before I get to that, though, I have to let you guys in on a little secret. I've been talking about how we can use machine learning and all of these fancy things. Uh, but when we launched this product line, we actually had no data. It was a brand new product line. Nobody had ever bought anything. So it's really hard to predict probabilities of purchase when you have no training data. Uh, and so what we ended up doing was we kind of cheated a little bit. We basically just made up a bunch of rules, and we assigned point values to them. And so an example of one of these rules might be we decided, all right, if this item is within the customer's budget, then that customer gets 50 points if they get that item. Um, and so that's actually really easy to handle in this, because uh, we know the customer's budget up front. We know the cost of the item up front. And so we can kind of pre-calculate all of this and aggregate all of our points up into a score. For this item, how much is this worth for this customer? Um, so that's pretty easy. A much harder score that we came up with was something like if the customer gets an outfit, where maybe the outfit is uh, some particular top that goes with a skirt, then the customer gets 100 points. The problem is we don't know this ahead of time because that's literally what we're trying to solve for is what is the customer going to get. And so this is actually, uh, it ends up being fairly difficult. But it turns out that you can solve this by kind of creating your own mini optimization problem. So uh, you define new decision variables saying, did the customer get an outfit or not? We define constraints around deciding uh, how do we know if they got the outfit or not? And then we can kind of add this into our objective function. Uh, but it ends up being kind of a, an entire sub-problem within the, the parent problem. Um, 
And one tip for experts in the audience is uh, a good way to do this is to use this thing called the Big N method. Uh, you, it's actually a real thing. You can Google it. There's a whole Wikipedia page about it, uh, and that worked quite nicely for us to, to set these up. Um, we can now move over to the constraint side of things. So what are the deterministic constraints that we know ahead of time? An example is uh, users can't get items that don't fit them. Uh, that, that's a pretty obvious one. And the nice thing is that we know this ahead of time. We know the size of the product. We know the size of the customer. And so an easy way to solve this is you just don't make those decision variables. If the computer never has the option to give the customer this product, then they're never going to get it. Um, and kind of another, another pro tip for this is that when you stop making some of these decision variables, you end up with this kind of weird sparse matrix between users and items, and graph structures end up working out pretty well for keeping track of these relationships. Um, stochastic constraints, these are kind of the ones that I was talking about before. So an example might be customers must receive between X and Y shirts. Uh, maybe we have a minimum and maximum number of shirts that they have to get in their box. And unfortunately, there's kind of no real way around this. You end up having to do the mental gymnastics and the math that I showed before in order to define these. But kind of once you started to solve a couple of these, you start to figure out the tricks of how to do other ones. Um, and so one thing that helped was that when we define these kind of concepts uh, that I was talking about before, you end up kind of creating these isolated pieces of code. So for example, every type of score that we had, uh, we created a class for. And every type of uh, constraint that we had, we created a class for. And that actually helps you out a lot when you end up in uh, moving into testing your code. Uh, but one thing is that unit tests are super hard uh, for these types of problems. Uh, it's really hard to write like a unit test for some constraint function, which is this weird inequality and everything else. And so what we end up doing more is testing for behavior. And so maybe for a particular constraint, if we want to test it, we might solve a very quick, tiny optimization problem with and without the constraint. And then we make sure that uh, that constraint is satisfied for different inputs. Um, and in order to do that in a nice way, it really helps to invest in some test setup functions. So writing some functions which allow you to quickly create tiny optimization problems uh, or quickly basically run your pipeline. Because like everything in data science, I feel like, ends up being a pipeline. And so if you can quickly set up your pipeline, then you can test it. Also, if you can quickly set it up, then your code is probably in a good place. Um, so now that we have good code, or good enough code, uh, we have tests. Now, how does this? kind of software end up interfacing with the rest of our tech ecosystem. And so one thing that we've found helpful at DNCO is building microservices and really isolating kind of the core competency of the code in different places. And so what we ended up doing is we didn't want to have to consider all sorts of extraneous business logic in this optimization algorithm. So for example, I don't want to have to you know, maintain the code that decides how many units do we have in inventory, uh, or like maintain the code that decides which boxes do we need to style today. And so what we end up doing is we kind of have our isolated uh, optimization algorithm over here, and all of our inventory uh, information is stored in Elasticsearch, and we can just send quick get requests to pull down product data uh, and kind of like the real-time state of our inventory. And then we, in order to figure out which boxes we need to style, we had our dev team build out a very lightweight API, and all I got to do is say, hey, what boxes do I have to style? I pull down the information, I run the algorithm, and then we send patch requests back, which basically update the contents of these boxes. And that way, uh, you know, it was already enough work to get this whole thing running, and we don't have to know about the rest of the system. So that all sounded nice and good, as though everything always goes great. But of course, things don't always go great. Things break, and things did break. And so one thing that helps is being able to plan around failures, and because failures are inevitable. Um, and so uh, kind of two things helped me out with this. One was that kind of the default mode of these algorithms is uh, to solve them to the best possible solution. So if we want to maximize purchases, it's going to find really like the theoretical maximum purchase sum uh, for the whole algorithm. But remember I said that we kind of like made up these points and things like that. And so the difference between, you know, 0.001% and 1% of the theoretical maximum is probably just noise at this point. 
And so one thing that helped was don't require the algorithm to you know, perfectly solve the problem. Within 1% is probably pretty great already. And so that helped. The other thing that helped was uh, we figured out that these stochastic scores that I talked about, those really slowed the algorithm down. If we remove them, we could really quickly solve and get a good solution. Uh, and so what we end up doing now is we actually solve a simpler version of our problem, which is still a valid solution. It still satisfies all of our business constraints. And then now we have a minimum viable solution. And then we can pass that in as a starting point for solving uh, the more complicated version of our problem. And so. One, we're guaranteed a viable solution. And then two, it turns out having a good starting point really helps these algorithms to solve faster. Um, and so both of these really, really helped us to uh, make sure that we were able to style boxes every single day. Um, and now that we have all of this set up, like how do we end up iterating on this? Because it's very rare that kind of the first time that you build a, a an algorithm that it's really the best and then you just leave it and walk away. Uh, and so one thing that helps to iterate is to be able to frequently deploy and really run code in production. And so we use kind of a whole host of different services to do this. Everything is uh, containerized with Docker so that our local development matches cloud deployment as much as possible. Everything runs through CircleCI so that all of our tests are required to pass and that everything gets automatically deployed. Um, and then we kind of use these various cloud services uh, to kind of you know abstract away the cloud infrastructure and just let the code run uh, without us having to maintain it too much. Um, once we have all of that in place, how do we end up improving this model? So one thing that I did was I sat down with kind of the domain experts at my company, like the people that are on the merchandising team and the styling team, and we just stared at things. So we had no data to work with or anything else, and so instead we would just run the algorithm, look at boxes that uh, came out of the algorithm, look at customers' profiles, and then we just kind of tweak our point values and tune the knobs a little bit until we saw things that uh, satisfied the domain experts. And so that was like a nice place to start, but it's not very scientific. And so that's when we have to turn to the ridiculous world of machine learning. And so with that, uh, what we decided to do was instead of having these points, let us learn what is the best value for these points to take. And so the way to do that is we decided to turn these points in our system, you know, if you get an item in your budget, it's 50 points or whatever, turn that into an actual coefficient of a machine learning model. Um, and so the way that this works is that each of these rules and points that we made up, those become a feature in our machine learning model. Um, the observation or the sample in our machine learning data set is going to be an individual box and then we are going to learn a function to map these features uh, in order to predict some box level metric. So maybe it's like number of purchases in the box, zero through five. Maybe it's like total revenue uh, that we make off of this box. And so the way this ends up working is we have our feature matrix X down here. We're gonna learn some weights and then we're gonna have, create some function that ends up predicting some box level metrics. And I guess just a quick shout out here, I haven't done any of this, so I passed the project on with, with the, uh, the hand-tuned points to Nick Cridler, who's another machine learning engineer at DNCo, and he has now built out the machine learning layer that lives on top of all of this. And so the way this ends up working is that each row is going to be an individual box, we have our features, which is like, is there an outfit in the box or not? Or how many items were within budget? So we have to aggregate everything up to the box level. We're gonna learn weights. So this is like, how, how much is it worth for there to be an outfit in the box? How much is it worth for there to be uh, items within our budget? And then we're gonna learn these weights such that we're able to predict some business metric. Let's say it's number of items kept. If we can learn these weights, then we can feed them into our objective function and really maximize for purchases or for revenue in a way that is kind of quantitatively sound. Um, the other nice thing is that in order to build this, you end up getting a pretty interpretable model. Remember, we, like, we sat down and created all of our features by hand, which 
we all probably should be doing when we design machine learning algorithms, but oftentimes uh, you just shove a bunch of stuff in there and then hope that your metrics look good. Uh, but in this case, it ends up being a lot of work to define this all in the optimization problem, and so you end up being fairly conservative in how you build your features. And then the other thing is that all of this has to be a linear model for it to work with these optimization algorithms. And so on the, on the one hand, you don't get to use deep learning or random forests or anything like that. Uh, you basically just have to use regression. But on the other hand, because you're doing that, because you spent a lot of time, you're now learning uh, really kind of like how important are each of these features. And then we can also use that to inform our stylists and tell them, uh, you know, why did the algorithm think that, this, that the customer would like this item? We now have an interpretable model and we can surface that up to them. So if any of that sounded interesting to you, uh, then I'd be happy to talk afterwards about this. I've also written some blog posts about optimization problems if you didn't get enough math there. Uh, and then uh, if you're interested in any of these types of problems or in other problems, we work on a lot of them, uh, we're definitely hiring for data engineering roles, machine learning roles, et cetera. And there is a booth downstairs uh, where you can talk with other people from the company. So thank you. Gotcha. Uh, so I would say the product catalog is, let's say, tens of thousands of products. Um, but we can kind of call this down ahead of time because, you know, we're not going to select from products that don't fit a customer. Uh, certain things might not be in stock and things like that. Yeah. So we haven't we haven't done any segmentation of our customers or anything for the machine learning component. Uh, basically, what we wanted to start with was. W I have always wondered what should these point values have been because I just tweaked them by hand. And so that's really where we've started it out is let us learn the best values for the points. And then we're going to start adding more features in, iterating on that and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, some of the things like actually the outfit one, that was a major pain to figure out how to code that up. Um, and it turns out, at least as far as we've been able to tell so far, it's not so important to have that in there. And so it's like nice to know now, but I would have liked to know that ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, so the, the question was around uh, the fact that we were able to get good results with open source software. And was that because of the software? Or was that because of kind of us figuring things out? So the software is pretty good. Uh, pulp is kind of an API that hooks up to different solving libraries. So pulp handles the first three steps in that pipeline. The solving part that I don't know anything about, that's handled by other libraries. And we use this library called Coin, which is free, and is about the best free library you can get for integer programming. Uh, I would say that we were able to get good results because uh, I ended up spending a fair amount of time doing things like solving simple versions of the problem and feeding that in. Uh, the libraries are okay, but there is there are proprietary libraries that are pretty expensive, and they are like orders of magnitude better than the open source ones. So it's very different than the world of like deep learning, where TensorFlow is free and everybody enjoys it. Uh, optimization algorithms are still kind of in the closed source uh, area. Yeah, so it's kind of hard uh, to do that, and so we basically we've been looking at a number of different metrics. So. Uh, one thing is we know exactly what the algorithm puts into the box, and then we know what the stylist chooses to send to the customer. And then we know what does the customer keep, uh, how do they rate the items, and things like that. And so you can kind of think of the thing, whole thing like a funnel. So what, what should our algorithm, like what is our goal? The goal would be for the algorithm to basically place items in the box that the stylist is like, yeah, that's a great idea, and then the customer keeps it. Um, and so we can look at metrics like how often are stylists swapping things out. For things that they swap out, uh, is the customer more or less likely to keep these items and things like that. And so that, that's one way. Uh, the other way is you can run A-B tests. And so uh, an example would be maybe half the boxes that they, the algorithm styles, and half the boxes uh, we have somebody else, uh, a human style. And then you can kind of compare these results. We haven't run those A-B tests though.